The following podcast may contain adult language and conversations revolving around situations not suitable for immature audiences. Spoilers and general political incorrectness can often be expected, so listener discretion is advised. They must be destroyed on sight! No, I literally just said, kind of, I'll just, we'll talk about it on the air, it's fine. Um, I do have a list of a few movies for the, uh, kind of, instead of Jesus Camp, mm-hmm. so uh, we can do that at the beginning if you want, and then I know you've got some comments you want to read, um, and so, yeah. yeah. Anything you might have watched this week, if you want to bring that up. I haven't really watched anything this week, except for um, what I did for the podcast, so. Um, All right, cool. I'll, I just have one I'll just briefly mention, and okay. that'll be it. Okay. Um, all right. We are back. Welcome to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight, a movie podcast. I'm your host, Leah Russell, with my co-host, Daniel Harper. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. I just ate an egg roll, so I might have a little bit of cabbage in my teeth. Hopefully that's not going to uh, disturb anybody, but, you know. <laughs> uh, other than that, doing just fine. I'm just surprised the cabbage is not in your beard. Uh, we usually, I mean, the gravitational pull of the beard is not quite as large um, yeah. as to attract the cap, so we're good. <laughs> All right, so uh, today is going to be sort of uh, Daniel's show more than my show because he picked the movies this time around, so uh, uh, it'll be interesting. He, he definitely picked two, uh, in some ways, very vastly different films and uh, very interesting films at that, and uh, we will be getting into those later. Uh, but First, we'll do a little bit of a follow-up from a previous episode uh, where we were talking about a movie you watched, uh, Jesus Camp, and you Mm -hmm. had suggestions for better documentaries than Jesus Camp, as we both sort of uh, said it wasn't a very very good documentary overall. So uh, if if you'd like to run down a list of uh, similar films that are much better, Daniel, uh, go right ahead. Sure. Um, they're not. Uh, one of these is not a documentary. I'll just uh, throw that out there. But um, I really was trying to go for stuff that would kind of help you to understand the evangelical subculture uh, mm-hmm. in the United States, and I assume in Canada it's not too different. But you know, at least in the in the United States, um, and kind of the the way that the evangelical subculture is kind of married to the religious right, mm-hmm. um, and so it's become not just a, a religious or a social movement, but a kind of political wing of yeah. a particular party. Um, but first, I, I think the one of the best ways to kind of uh, introduce yourself to this, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, actually a little uh, kind of independent comedy from uh, about ten years ago called Saved. Oh yeah, um, I remember this, that. Film. Uh, Macaulay Culkin has a small role in this. Um, Jenna Malone, um, and this is uh, uh, Mandy Moore. I mean, this is very much a, a film about this uh, this young girl who gets pregnant. Mm-hmm. Uh, because she's kind of kept ignorant of, of birth control, and she believes Jesus told her to go sleep with her uh, gay friend <laughs> in order to convert him away from gayness, and during the process of kind of ostracization that that uh, implies, mm-hmm. uh, kind of comes to uh, a more tolerant and forgiving understanding of human nature. Um, but it's such a great... Uh, a little satirical piece about this kind of evangelical subculture. It's it honestly pulls a lot of punches. It's not nearly as as hard hitting as I think. Um, Michael Stipe was originally a uh, from REM was originally a um, producer on the film uh-huh. and didn't like the finished version uh, just because I think he was expecting it to be a lot more kind of dark comedy um, as opposed to just a, a little bit more kind of kind of indie, comedy, kind of friendly, happy kind of stuff. Um, but it's a really funny movie. Um, it's about 90 minutes long, and it's uh, probably worth seeing if you want to kind of get inside that subculture a little bit. Um, because you may think that some of this stuff is really, really out there, but I promise you it's not. Yeah, it <laughs> uh, For the most part, this is pretty straightforward. Um, all the rest of my list are uh, documentaries. Mm-hmm. Um, the Revisionaries, uh, this is from a few years ago, I think 2009 or 2010. Um, and this is a film about um, a school board. There, there's a uh, uh, the Texas State School Board. Um, 
approving committee for textbooks uh-huh. um, and looking to essentially um, insert language that would uh, approve the teaching of intelligent design in Texas classrooms um, and kind of the political battle behind the scenes in terms of that. Um, this is an important issue because it um, the big states uh, here in the U.S. like California and Texas and Florida um, uh, textbook publishers, you know, have to get their books approved by state, local, local and mm-hmm. state boards, and um, those textbooks get approved through standards that are written in the state legislatures. And yeah. hardly anybody on a national level is paying attention to these guys, so they get to kind of just go and do what they want. Um, and so, when some, you know, uh, fuck knuckle in Texas or Alabama, <laughs> particularly Texas or Florida decides to insert um, crazy-ass language, publishers don't want to write 50 different versions of the book. They want to write one version of the book, and so they write textbooks uh, following that path. And um, it is kind of one of the things that, um, you know, you know, a couple of people in a state legislature, in if you happen to be in Texas or Florida, can really affect the way that science is taught all over the place. And it's a really yeah. um, interesting look at the kind of inner dynamics of kind of how this works on a, on a nuts and bolts level. Yeah, and it's, insid- it's insidious how people like that, uh, I mean, they're they're the same people who uh, essentially change creationism into intelligent design to try to make it sound like a scientific theory, theory that should be, you know, taught uh, as counterpoint to evolutionary theory, so. Sure. Um, another uh, film kind of on the same uh, realm, uh, there's a film by a filmmaker named Randy Olson from a few years ago, it's called Flock of Dodos. Um, and this is uh, explicitly about the the uh, intelligent design movement and how um, you know creationism and intelligent design. Uh, you know, he interviews a bunch of the kind of leading lights in that movement and kind of how they uh, communicate with one another. Um, I think this is a, a really now this is kind of a fun movie. I mean, it's designed to be this kind of uh, funny uh, Daily Show style documentary. Um, oh yeah. And uh, I think it. it it's not perfect, but it's definitely uh, it does help to kind of understand that. Um, and then two that are kind of explicitly uh, political, um, kind of showing the the rise of uh, one of them is actually a film called Journeys with George, um, and this is a, a film uh, filmed during the 2000 presidential election, which sure. um, led to George W. Bush being um, elected. I put in quotes uh, <laughs> president of the United States for for the first four years. Um, it's a film made by Alexandria Pelosi, who is uh, Nancy Pelosi's daughter. Um, uh-huh. Nancy Pelosi being the prior, uh, the previous um, um, uh, oh, Senate Majority Leader. Yeah, um, yeah. she's she's still in um, uh, California, but uh, she is uh, probably House Majority Leader anyway. Whatever. Uh, she was a she's a high up person in the in the uh, United States Legislature. Um, but uh, her daughter, I mean, really. It was a pretty balanced portrait, I think, all in all, in terms of like, you know, George Bush was a was a nice guy and and funny and and charming and ate a lot of junk food and uh, you know the, the film goes through. Uh, apparently, he loved Cheetos, as I recall. Um, you know, so, so he's constantly eating Cheetos. Um, yeah, he was a frat boy for fuck's sakes. I mean, he was, and uh, but it, but it very much is a film that kind of follows just the the political campaign, and mm-hmm. you kind of get to see what the inner circle of what this is like. Um, and once you kind of see, I mean, you know, as someone who is kind of familiar with the political scene and kind of follows this stuff, you know, there's um, not much that was, like, new to me, but it is kind of like, you know, well, if you're a political pr- reporter on these, uh, on the trail of a candidate, you listen to the stump speech over and over and over again, and so you can kind of get footage of, like, the reporters literally, like, mumbling along with Bush's stump speech <laughs> because he just says it over and over again. Um, you get the way that the little... Uh, um, uh, interpersonal conflicts between uh, Bush and some of the reporters affected like who got to sit in the front and who got to be favored mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. And um, this it's a little bit less like focused on this uh, kind of religious right issue, but I certainly think if you want to understand you know kind of the political situation in the United States and the way that the uh, the right wing is kind of married to that, um, I think it's worth seeing. Um, this one is I don't I don't know that it's on Netflix, but I know I think um, it, uh, there was a YouTube link. I think that it's on YouTube, so um, I haven't checked it out to see if it's there. And the last one I promise is the last one, um, and this is a film called Boogeyman: The Lee Atwater Story. Okay. Um, this is uh, Lee Atwater is basically the uh, progenitor to Carl Rove, 
Um, Carl Rove basically did the uh, the Lee Atwater playbook. Um, Lee Atwater was this guy, um, Southern honky tonk kind of guy, played in a blues band. Um, you, if you met him, he'd probably be a nice, amiable guy. He's dead now, but um, this uh, he's also the guy who kind of invented the idea of uh, we're gonna divide and conquer the political world, and we're gonna marry ourselves to the religious right, and um, it shows just just how he did uh, dirty tricks and. All sorts of other stuff to uh, to do that, and um, yeah, no, that's that's five movies that are uh, better than Jesus Camp at showing this world, um, and that's kind of what I was going for. And uh, if I think of any more, I'll I'll show them on a preview on a future podcast. But that was kind of what I came up with after just kind of thinking about it for a while. Um, and all five are are really good movies if you want to kind of get at the core of this. Yeah, awesome, and I'll try to. Uh find some appropriate links, even if it's just the uh, internet movie database links, I'll uh, put them in the show notes as well. So uh, people sure. can check them out if they want to. Cool. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, I do have one movie to mention that I watched in, in the previous week, but before we get to that, we should get to uh, user comments. Uh, try to <laughs> try to get th- this out of the way uh, expediently as possible, but uh, might not happen because uh, our, uh, our good friend of the show, uh, Greg, has uh, left a nice little smattering of comments on our last episode, so uh, we'll try to get through them here. Uh, really appreciate it, by the way, Greg. Um, he's been uh, leaving some really great comments the last couple of weeks. So uh, first he says, uh, I know I'm a bit late to the party, but I really enjoyed your Christopher Lee tribute. Very well done. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I was actually quite... Uh, quite personally uh, happy with how that one turned out. So uh, thanks very much. Um, in our response to our movie God questions, he says, Die Hard versus Lethal Weapon. Both original movies are classics, but I'd give the nod to Die Hard. In terms of sequels, I think you don't give Lethal Weapon 2 enough credit. It's also a classic in his opinion. Parts 3 and 4 are not terrible, but don't live up to the originals. Die Hard 2 and 3 were okay. The fourth one is watchable, and the latest one is terrible. I definitely agree there. Um, overall, as a franchise, I'd give it to Lethal Weapon. But if I had to kill one, it would be Lethal Weapon, as I feel it's much less influential. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Although, I honestly, I'm just... I really don't give a fuck about Lethal Weapon, honestly. It's just that, 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 that whole series really doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> I, I, I agree that the second film, I don't remember if I said this on the podcast uh, last week, but I agree that the second film is actually quite good. Um, the first two are, are really nice. And the first one is um, uh, written by uh, Shane Black, mm-hmm. who is uh, going to go on. He did uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang a few years yeah. ago. He wrote and directed that. And then Iron Man 3. And... Um, I, you know, that's the one that really made his name. Um, I, I think uh, if you haven't seen that in a while, it might be worth revisiting. Okay. Um, it's it's uh, you know it's definitely this kind of uh, '80s tastic uh, action film. I mean, it kind of set the standard for a lot of that. But there's a lot of really clever, interesting stuff going on in it, and um, I think that it, unfortunately, it, it's sort of hard to view it without um, viewing it in the context of a lot of its imitators later on. Now, you know, mm-hmm. um, a lot of it kind of feels old and hackneyed when it was new at the time. Um, and it's got Gary Busey being a badass, like before yeah. his motorcycle accident that like, ruined his brain. So you know, there's that too. <laughs> right on. Okay, and he says in response to our uh, Tim Burton Batman versus, versus Richard Donner Superman, he said he'd kill Superman over and over. Sure, it's one of the OG superhero movies, but it's also borderline unwatchable nowadays. He says Batman '89 still holds up as does its sequel. It also was the first time on screen that Batman became the dark superhero we know today, as this was a few years after Frank Miller's uh, released the uh, game-changing Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One. Um, Got to disagree there. Uh, although Superman, the original Superman does have that one really bullshit uh, turn the world, turn time back by flying around the world. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, fuck that shit. But uh, honestly, I I personally don't find that the Tim Burton Batmans hold up for me at all. Um, I, I watch them now, and I just can't. Um, I just can't do it. I, I, I find them. I 
I don't think uh, Michael Keaton is right for the part of Batman. Uh, I think Joker is the only good thing in that. Uh, there's no Commissioner Gordon character, really. Like, mm-hmm. Commissioner Gordon in that is just uh, totally neutered. He's he's worse than uh, the portrayals of Watson in early Sherlock Holmes films, where they just made him a bumbling oaf. Um, and Batman Returns, really don't like that one at all. Uh, I, I think the problem is Tim Burton didn't give a fuck about Batman. He was more interested in the villains than he was Batman himself, and it shows in the films for me personally, but that's just my opinion of it. So I haven't rewatched watched um, any of those films lately, as in, like, within the last ten years, so I, I'll... Uh, I, I have, you know, memories. I, uh, I think... Um, you know, from what I've kind of heard people talking about, you know, from the, from a while back, that, that Returns holds up better than the original, in a lot of uh, in a lot of people's minds, just because mm. it's it's a little bit darker, it's a little bit more elemental, and if you kind of, I mean, you're right that, um, I mean, let's be realistic, Batman is is really a boring character, like like Batman, you know, yeah, you're sad, your parents died, you know, you're this dark figure, you know. The only way to really make Batman interesting is to go full on psychopath with him, or to treat him as a camp character. Like you really come to these films as uh, you know, looking more at the the, the villains. I think, um, and that goes for the Christian Bale Batman. I mean, the, the Nolan Batman. I, I don't think, you know, you could swap out Christian Bale for for a lot of other actors. Mm-hmm. And I don't I don't know that the Dark Knight would suffer greatly if you know. Jake Gyllenhaal or somebody was playing, you know, <laughs> Batman instead of uh, Christian Bale. I think Christian Bale is a is a uh, a better Bruce Wayne than than Batman, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. For me, I do prefer, you know, personally, just the Superman films. I get where he's coming from where he says it's borderline unwatchable. I mean, there's a lot of uh, padding. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of stupid shit, you know, the can you read my mind sequence um, that takes up a good, you know, 15 minutes in the middle of the film. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the kind of bumbling Otis music. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of s- silly stuff in it, but ultimately I think there's a, there's a core that, that really works in that original uh, Donner Superman film and the, and the first sequel. I think in both cases, yeah, the first I, two are the really good ones. So, you know. Well, I, th- I think Superman 2 is better, and I think, I think overall there's a there's a really good sort of like uh, mythological kind of feeling to those films. Like there's mm. a bit of a myth building kind of thing there that really captures kind of the spirit of the actual character uh, and the stories surrounding him. And it's got that score. And uh, I, I won't apologize for absolutely loving that fucking title song. And the music's very oh, elevating, yeah. very very good. And I mean, you got you got Terrence Stamp as General Zod in the sequel, so I, I can't. I, I I love that. So. <laughs> oh, and uh, and the uh, the girl who played um, uh, Zora or Zara or whatever whatever her um, name is. Uh, yeah. Um. Fuck. I have yeah. I have a I have a photo of her. By the way, I've been I'm meaning to send this to you, and I'm saying it on on air now, so you get to either edit this out or um, show the photo. I'll send it to you. There's a photo where she did a, a stage production um, sometime in the uh, early, in the late 70s, I guess. Mm-hmm. And she is with John Pertwee um, in a bed, uh, naked, covering her breast with her with her hands. Yeah. And John Pertwee is kind of doing a, a similar motion with his. Um, yeah. And it's uh, both funny and sexy, so I'll uh, make sure to send that to you so you can awesome. enjoy it. I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself for not remembering her name because I really like her. And she was kind of like, woefully miscat like basically misused in films afterwards like her career just kind of petered out a bit and she was just kind of well, she has she has that issue i think that so many actresses have is you you reach your past fuckable day your, mm-hmm. your past fuckable day um which i i put in quotes here um just because i don't believe that that should be a thing sarah yeah. douglas sarah, sarah douglas, douglas yes Ursa. Yeah. Um, but you but you reach that period where uh, casting directors don't think anybody wants to fuck you anymore, and then you can't get work until later down the line you become uh, the mom character and everything, or the grandma. And uh, it's uh, pretty much fucking bullshit because there are lots of really talented women who uh, hit the age of 29 and then suddenly, oh, I can't get work anymore because, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, because, you know, no one, no, one, no one wants to fuck... Uh... Maggie Gyllenhaal anymore. She's just she's a dog now. I mean, she, yeah, she's she's, she's, very she's, a, she's a total dog. Yeah, yeah. I agree. <laughs> I mean, pathetic. I wouldn't. I wouldn't fuck her with your dick. 
uh, just for the record, I would do awful, awful things to Maggie Jalen Hall. Just, just for the record. Yeah. With my dick. Con- awesome. Consensually, consensually, but I would do <laughs> awful, awful things to Maggie Jalen Hall. Right on. Uh, and, and we we got... we'd reenact some secretary in my house. It would, it would be awesome. Uh, there we go. Well, that'd be much better than fucking uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Um. So, and he's got two more comments here, and uh, he said he watched both Blue Ruin and Nightcrawler in preparation for the podcast. Uh, awesome. So he probably even did more research than we did for that podcast. Um, he says Blue Ruin was awesome. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Nightcrawler was interesting, and I enjoyed most of it, but the ending just didn't work for me. I'm usually not a big fan of such open-ended conclusions. Um. I, I can sort of see his point. Like it, it, it feel the the conclusion f- sort of feels like maybe you can't quite believe he got away with it. But I don't know. I, I sort of bought into it because he's the character uh, is pretty pretty smart and pretty manipulative, and he covers his tracks pretty well. Like he's a straight up psychopath. He plans out the stuff he does. So I I, I didn't have a a lot of trouble uh, buying into the idea that he would, you know, end up being successful. I mean, there's a lot of successful psychopaths and <laughs> I mean, that is a, that is a trait that uh, uh, psychologists and stuff have, have basically, you know, uh, recorded that um, a lot of successful people are sort of these sort of psychopathic characters, not necessarily violent psychopaths, but psychopaths all the same, you know? I agree. Um, you know, for me, I just, you know, whenever I, I get that if the ending didn't work for you, it didn't work for you. Like, I mean, I understand. Um, but uh, for me, I mean, it's it's intended to be an open ending. It's intended mm-hmm. to um, not really draw draw the audience to a specific conclusion. And I think there are lots of conclusions that you can possibly draw about um, uh, Jake John Hall's character's motivations, about like what's going to happen later. Um, personally, I think that the that the cops gonna like um, find the um, find the unedited video footage, and he's mm-hmm. gonna end up going to prison. Um, that that's my personal opinion about what's going to happen to him uh, down the line, because uh, you know there's no way he covered his tracks that well. But yeah. um, you know the, the point isn't what he does next. The point is where he is now. Yeah, like, yeah. Like where where he where you know. He he wins essentially, and that's that's I think kind of the point of the film is that at least for right now, he has succeeded and he is uh, running a successful business. And um, even if he ended up going to prison, I think that business would continue and the the ethos that he developed would continue because it makes money for people. And I think that's I, I mean you know that's certainly a, a place that you could take this. I mean I don't know I I, I mean I, again I understand if you don't like the ending. Um, I don't think the ending is the strongest part of that film, mm-hmm. but um, I disagree that it's a problem necessarily. I mean, I just kind of, you know, I, I think the ending is what it is. Yeah, you make a good point. Like, even if down the line he went to jail, I mean, I think the main thing to look at is that he has started something that is going to, you know, because of his behavior and the way he is, it's going to attract more people like him, and that business is probably going to go on and succeed without him, uh, you know. So, I mean... Uh, you know, it's it's more of a criticism of that sort of personality type and media in general and the sensationalism and all that other stuff. I mean, you know, we could <laughs> we could start going off on a tangent on that shit. Yeah, but I, we're th- not I think we that. already talked for like 45 minutes about this film, so I don't know that yeah. we need to keep going. But uh, yeah, no, again, I get it. I just, you know, yes, I agree. It has yeah. it has a weird ending. <laughs> uh, and he also says uh, he he noticed an interesting similarity. Uh, between the two, what he considers uh, fairly two different, fairly uh, different movies, uh, Nightcrawler and uh, Maniac Cop Three. He said he watched both recently, and he noticed that they had some characters in uh, Maniac, Cop, Maniac Cop Three that are almost exactly like the characters in Nightcrawler, in that they are trying to get raw footage for the news. In fact, some of the early scenes in both movies, where they are listening to police scanners and speeding to crime scenes, almost mirror each other. Oh, interesting, because I've never seen Maniac Cop 3, so... I'm gonna have I to haven't either, it. so apparently we need to see it. And maybe yeah. maybe we could do a supercut of uh, <laughs> uh, Nightcrawler and Maniac Cop 3, uh, you know, make it one film. That that could be interesting. 
<laughs> yeah, right on. Maniac um, Nightcrawler, that's what we'll call it. <laughs> um, or Night Maniac. It, it's Robert Zadar in Maniac Cop 3. Uh, yeah, he was in all the Maniac Cops, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's, it'd be a Zadarific. Zadarific. Uh, super cut, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a silly mood. I apologize. It's <laughs> all right. You've been drinking all day. <laughs> I have been. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'll just mention briefly uh, what I watched uh, this week. I, the only thing I really watched of note was I revisited the Warriors uh, from 1979 after not watching. Have have not watched it for like 20 years, and I just saw it on Netflix and revisited it on a on a chance and found myself enjoying it a lot more than I did when I first saw it. Uh, I think the movie holds up really well. I think it improves with age, and I really love it. I, I love the. Uh, I, I think um, it's it's a very comic booky kind of movie. Like there, mm-hmm. it's got a very sort of comic booky style to it, action wise and everything like that. Very colorful characters, and I think it's uh, the main thing I took from it is that it's lacking. It, it it has in it what a lot of modern day sort of comic book adaptations are lacking at this point, where everything now has to be like really mean-spirited and gritty and uh, just uh, kind of depressing. And I find that um, this this movie still sort of captures the kind of stuff that I remember reading in comic books, like sort of the sense of fun and, um, you know, a bit more lightheartedness to it than uh, what I see in comic book movies these days. So, you know, it, there's, never, there's never one, like, uh, way to do these kind of things, you know, because, mm-hmm. uh, you know... Uh, I tend to get a a pretty uh, low tolerance for you know kind of silly kind of bright comedy sort of stuff and, mm-hmm. and but it also depends on the on on what movie you're you're making you know um so um I actually haven't seen the Warriors but I've seen so many ripoffs and parodies of it that I feel like I've seen the Warriors so <laughs> um but uh yeah I'll I'll have to check that out sometime that I mean it's kind of always been on my list of like oh yeah I should watch that at some point but I've I've just never seen it so I'll just leave it at that. Right on. All right, so uh, we'll move on now, and we'll get to our first film that Daniel picked for us this week, and I think we'll start with The Libertine from 1968, so I'll uh, hand it over to you for the introduction there, Daniel. Sure. Um, I picked two films. I literally sat and uh, looked at uh, what was uh, in kind of the featured Netflix things and just found two films that I was pretty sure Lee hadn't seen, that I knew I hadn't seen, and that would be interesting, and it would have nothing to do with one another. So that was that was kind of the the, the goal today, uh, was to pick two things that looked interesting that I would like to watch, that I wasn't didn't think Lee had seen that would be fun to talk about. Um, so the Libertine is essentially a film. It's from '68. It's a, a kind of European art house erotic picture. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a film about a kind of kept woman who uh, her husband dies. Her kind of her kind of sugar daddy dies. Uh, she finds out that he had this secret life where he was uh, sleeping around and engaging in all kinds of um, kinky sex uh, with uh, a number of, of people that she knows, and it kind of portrays her investigating that world mm-hmm. uh, and, um, you know, eventually finding some degree of happiness. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, that that's kind of the plot summary. I don't know. What did you think of uh, the Libertine before I kind of go off on it? I think. All right. Um, so when I first started watching it, and uh, I'll I'll just say these two movies you picked, I didn't do any research to start with. I just went into both of them cold just for just for the fuck of it. So that's pretty um, much what I do with every few days is just sit down and watch it. So you yeah. know. Yeah. So I I started watching this, and uh, my initial feeling was like, okay, this is going to be something of sort of typical of the era. It's going to be sort of the typical kind of. Uh, sex exploitation, sexy farce slash comedy that a lot of this stuff was coming from Italy at the time. Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, really badly stereotyped male characters and a lot of really badly stereotyped female characters engaging in all kinds of uh, stuff that we were talking about in our sex comedy series, essentially, except for to a much higher degree, right? Um, right. But actually, uh, I found myself enjoying it somewhat i was i was definitely impressed from the start that uh it definitely wasn't going in that direction it was a bit more thoughtful it was a bit more interested in the main character uh it was much more about her exploration after uh discovering her her ex or her uh 
her late husband's uh, basically uh, little sex uh, <laughs> bordello apartment well, thing he had how, going on. How nice. Yeah, it is that apartment, by the way. Like that is, yeah. like that is that is very much what people in 1968 thought a luxury apartment looked like. Um, just to let you know, like that is yeah. so. Um, you see, you hear like you know, you know, um, <laughs> you hear like apartment kept for sex, and you know, like on the side, and wow, it's very much exactly what. You know the the highest end version of that possible. I think that you could put yeah. in, a, in a cheap apartment. So yeah, we're talking an apartment where like basically all the walls are mirrors. <laughs> mm-hmm. there, there's a there's a mirror on the ceiling. There's a mirror on the floor. Yeah. Um, you know, in the seventies there would be cocaine everywhere. You know, this mm-hmm. this is just uh, you know it, it's, it's definitely um, the the set dressing reminded me a little bit of uh, some of the middle parts of Goodfellas. Yeah, where uh, you you know all the shag carpeting and the plush and the you know and all that sort of thing. Um, um. Yeah. Uh. Just sorry. I'm. I'm just gonna say my my general feeling of the film. Um. You know, this definitely isn't a sexploitation film. That yeah. this kind of uh, predates that a little bit, or at least you know. Um. This is a lot more in that kind of European art house mm-hmm. sex film. Uh. A more recent film, which I now realize is 15 years old, but there was a film called Romance. Uh. Back in I think 99 or 2000, which uh, kind of follows a similar journey where this woman kind of discovers. Um, it doesn't have, the, I think, the dead husband aspect, but you know, kind of uh, young women discovering their sexuality through, um, you know, quote unquote deviant sex acts is a mm-hmm. pretty common genre in the uh, in in Europe at least, or in, in uh, you see a lot of you know kind of European art house films that kind of have this general uh, strategy. Um, it's only about 82 minutes long or something like that, and uh, I I actually enjoyed it. I was. Uh, you know, it's kind of one that I sat and just watched through, um, didn't think too much about. Uh, I think that what I do like about it is that it, A, is, is definitely from her perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it definitely kind of portrays her not as someone, just someone curious and someone like yeah. seeking certain amounts of social approval from the from the men that she sleeps with. I mean, the whole thing is like, I don't want to be a cold fish. I don't want to be a wife. Um, it's made in the kind of height of the uh, sexual revolution, Mm-hmm. Um and uh, kind of the, the beginning of the women's lib uh, kind of stuff and you yeah. you definitely see that in the in the attitudes that that some people have towards her and uh, I think it's a, I mean it's definitely not a a realistic portrayal but I no. think that like psychologically I mean it, it kind of makes sense um, and well it follows a it follows a really clear through line in her exploration and it doesn't go like I was expecting it honestly. Like reading the kind of plot summary on Wikipedia before mm-hmm. when I picked it, I was kind of expecting it to kind of like the last third to kind of be like a lot more lurid, mm-hmm. um, but it really more follows like <laughs> her exploration of her sexual desires and she finds this guy who kind of gets along with her mm-hmm. and kind of dares her to greater heights, but it's sort of in this like I accept you, come on, just I want to be with you and not caring, you know, so so she does find this person who respects her as a person in the way that her, her husband probably didn't, in the way that her other lovers definitely don't, yeah. and in that kind of finds sexual fulfillment, which I think is uh, uh, that that's, it's a much more sophisticated message than you get out of some of these films. Yeah, um it's interesting because uh, basically the way the movie works it's it's mostly just an inner cut series of vignettes uh mm-hmm. where she moves on from partner to partner um and basically what s- sort of strives us on is that in the apartment she finds this book that her late husband left where he was rating all of his lovers he was you know yeah. he was and so she goes by that handbook at first and she also buys a sex book from this uh, creepy dude at the at the bookshop <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a little like a a, a, a a sex manual, like a like yeah. a like a academic tome about you know it's called like uh, sexualis psycho psychosexuality or something like yeah. that. It's a, it's a very like explicitly this is a textbook about like deviant sex essentially. Yeah. And uh, so she so she goes through this very uh, uh, academically, very scientifically to a degree where she, where mm-hmm. she's you know uh, the first. The first guy she uh, s- uh, sleeps with is uh, her uh, late husband's best friend, mm-hmm. who she who she seduces, and um, 
and then after they have sex, she essentially asks him to rate how good she was. <laughs> right. And, I mean, yeah. it's it's very clear at the beginning that she's trying to live up to this ideal of like mm-hmm. what what why did why did my husband not want to yeah, do well, these things with yeah. me? Why you know what was wrong with me? And you definitely get into this kind of the the Madonna whore phenomenon. Mm-hmm. You know that this the dichotomy that so many men you know like. Oh, I can't have dirty sex with my wife. I have dirty sex with the woman on the side, and then you get into the um, the double standard that you know these men like consider her to be deviant and awful, and you know when she's just doing what they're doing already, you know, sort of yeah. thing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not like there's not like a a whole lot of that going on. I mean, it's really kind of. Uh, this is this isn't quite like delivery system for nudity. I mean, it definitely no. kind of serves as that. Um, but it's a it's a it's a really um, it's fairly light and frothy in terms. Of, I mean, we kind of talk about it in a little bit headier terms, but um, I think it it moves pretty fast, and, it, and it, mm-hmm. I think it works as a film. I mean, I wouldn't say this is a great film. It's not the best film in this genre that I've seen, no. but it, it definitely works as a um, as a story. And again, it's it's eighty two minutes long, and it's worth you know it's worth your eighty two minutes if you're at all interested in it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean. Um... I'll put it this way. Uh, it's funny. Uh, the attitudes back then now, uh, what, what they thought were, you know, perverse or, you know, uh, deviant sexual acts now are like, you know, kind of yawners for a, a lot of people at this point. Um, sure. I mean, this, this movie, I was watching it and it was sort of starting to remind me a bit of, like I mentioned, I think to you, um, that I I read like the first third of Fifty Shades of Grey like a, sure. a while back, and it was kind of reminding me that it was like okay this is it's not that <laughs> it's not that out there or weird mm-hmm. um, so you know in in a way this movie doesn't quite age as well in in that degree but I don't I don't have a problem with that um, funny you mentioned the nudity in this film uh, very little nudity really. Uh, the main actress, she uh, who plays Mimi, she actually had a body double, body double for most of her scenes. She didn't even really do most of her nudity. Yeah. Um, what else? Do it was uh, there's a couple other things. Um, yeah, I, I find the final uh, act of the film actually works better than most of the rest of the film, just because the two characters are much more engaging at that point. Like it, it sort of brings in a sense of a kind of. Uh, screwball comedy more explicitly and yeah. it's just more interesting like their back and forth banter I mean the, the guy she eventually uh, hooks up with and falls in love with is uh, Jean-Louis Trentignant uh, probably pronounce his name totally wrong but uh, he's a French director pretty famous French director and actor sure. um, I like the line where <laughs> uh, I, I think it was with the I think it was with the first uh, guy she sleeps with uh, he's uh, undressing her in the mirror, and then she starts taking her eyelashes off, and she's like, "He's like, what are you doing? I'm undressing." <laughs> I right. thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, there there are definitely moments of a of a kind of dark comedy to this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, one other thing I would mention about the film is that it feels like there's uh, a the the version that's on Netflix actually has like moments where the the film stock kind of changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I suspect is like um, the version that we're watching, the version that's kind of been digitized and put on streaming. Um, it might be a uh, kind of a rough edit of a, a couple of different versions yeah. of the film, they're, or they're, um, you know, where, where little pieces of it have been edited back in, but not like recolorized and everything. Um, it also feels like there are uh, sequences that might be uh, edited out. Yeah. Um, in particular, um, where where I mean, it's it's strongly implied, or if not outright stated, that uh, the woman sleeps with her um, maid's boyfriend mm-hmm. and has and has sex with him. Um, but we're not ever shown that on screen or yeah. any you know any kind of. So I suspect there might be a sequencer, uh, whatever. If if at least uh, wasn't like shot and then dropped from the film at some point. Um, probably was in the original script that got that got dropped. Um, I yeah. think there's, 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 like, there's a little subplot that feels like it, it didn't make it to the final film. Well, I, I was reading a bit up on this after I watched it, and it, it appears that um, there's like a couple vastly different versions of this film, right. um, especially especially when they were trying to sell it overseas. Um, I, I think it got an X rating at the time, which you know uh, 
would be the equivalent of getting an NC-17 at this point because uh, mm-hmm. that was that was before it was just um, – or before or after. I can't remember when it was, you know, they were given X's to uh, full-out porn, you know. Um, and now – actually, now I don't even think it would get that. I think it might get a R at the most at this point. Yeah, but, no, I mean, it's really, it's really more implied. I mean, there's some um... – <laughs> what I find interesting, I mean, I, I do, uh, I do have some uh, connection to, you know, kind of the BDSM community and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. I know, know people involved in it and that sort of thing. And um, this is this is a fairly, I mean, again, I, I kind of use the word realistic advisedly, but uh, it's a fairly realistic view of like a young woman's exploration of some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, she finds a book that isn't very good at explaining some things and has some just out and out inaccurate information. In it. Let's just put it <laughs> that way. Um, she uh, starts trying to explore this with a series of uh, partners who she fantasizes about. In a way, it's sort of uh, connected to uh, the immoral Mr. T's because <laughs> she has these like kind of fantasy sequences about the people in her life uh, being yeah. involved in, in uh, kinky sex. And then um, she uh, you know, finds partners who are abusive, but she doesn't like recognize it as that. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, this is all too often the uh, the pattern that young women find when they when they try to enter these kinds of worlds, and um, it's 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 a shame. I mean, it isn't universal uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. There are like really good people who will like invite people into this world in a, in a he- healthy and wholesome way, and there are a lot mm-hmm. of better resources out there in 2015 than there were in 1968. Um, but I, I do think that like a young woman who is approaching this at the time. Uh, would probably run into a lot of the the same experiences that this uh, woman runs into, including a, I mean, she she is raped in the film, although she doesn't recognize it as that, and I don't think that the uh, the perpetrator does either. But there's there's definitely a, a rape in the middle of this film, mm-hmm. um, but it is dealt with in a, in a kind of in a, in a more mature way than you know when we talk about like the ginger rapist from the van, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> like wow, well, well, I just committed rape. Yeah. Um, no, this is uh, it, it is kind of portrayed as, as something that is that is wholeheartedly negative um, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's 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 fairly like I said, it, it's kind of dated, so it it kind of it feels a little light to me. I guess is, mm-hmm. is the best way to put it. Um, I, I I love the uh, lead actress. She's uh, really good. Uh, she's they're all, they're all, unfortunately they're all uh, of course uh, English dubbed in, so it's not their the actors' <laughs> the original voices. <laughs> Excuse you me, all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, except for the one line that she speaks, where it's an address and it's in Italian, mm-hmm. and apparently they left the, du- the her dialogue in. You know, so. That moment, I assume you're listening to her voice. It's in the. It's right after she uh, prostitutes herself, oh, yeah, and then okay. she she gets the cab. And then, um, I was I was kind of not expecting to hear it, and then you hear her. You know, someone actually say something in an Italian accent, and you go, "Oh, so that's probably actually her voice there." Yeah. Um, but you know, again, this is this is you know the the. Uh, Multiple re-edits of the film, the you know kind of different versions, the uh, the dubbing, um, the bad editing, uh, all that. It's very uh, traditional. I mean, this is not at all unique to this film from this mm-hmm. era. I mean, you know, films particularly made in like Italy, um, yeah, uh, being exported to the U.S. market uh, or to the international market would, would go through this all the time. And so uh, it's almost it's almost a surprise even that we have as much of this as we do. Because yeah. you know nobody was really archiving this shit either. You know, it's not like there was a, a central body that was that cared. I mean, it's, so it's just like a film canister that you know somebody probably digitized and put out there. You know, sort of thing. So. Oh yeah, no, it was um, uh, films at that point were just disposable products to make money. I mean, that's all it was. You know? yeah. At least to the big wigs, anyway. But yeah, um, yeah uh, the only other two things I think I take away from this are uh, a the husband. Uh, the late husband, he had uh, he had a pretty elaborate uh, setup for filming his uh, his little uh, his little films because he had multiple camera angles, <laughs> multiple camera angles, edits, uh, close ups. I mean, there there was a there was a lot of uh, you know I I uh, I was struck in terms of those film clips. Just uh, not to uh, not to push us too far too too much further into this, but 
you know, there there is a, a kind of thriving uh, community of people like looking at things like vintage erotica, mm -hmm. and um, you know, someone who is interested in kind of a BDSM world up into you know up to really the internet era up until like the mid '90s, a lot of what you had was more uh, you know these kind of old films and these kind of old clips that were in old movies and that sort of thing. And even today, there are kind of collectors who find these these old clips from the from the 40s or the 30s or whatever, and they, they look very much like that with really um, terrible whipping action and, um, <laughs> like, really, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at the technique going, oh, no, this, is, this isn't working. Like, I, I promise you. <laughs> um, there, there's no, like, real effect happening here. Yeah. Um, um, particularly, uh, there's, there's a sequence, a fantasy sequence, where the uh, woman is, is being bullwhipped. And uh, the, the, yeah, no, it it doesn't work like that. I, I, you know, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, the only uh, the only other thing I'll say is, uh, you know, uh, I kind of wish I was a horse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that that's a good place to end. It's a good place to end. I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, I, I'd say uh, we both give it a. Uh, I think maybe Daniel ha gives it a slightly uh, more more of a recommendation than I do, but I, I still say see it. I mean, go on Netflix; it's on there, so see it. Yeah. And I, I think I there's have, I have there's... an interest in kind of classic erotica kind of stuff. I mean, this is this is kind of up my alley a little bit more. Um, so I mean, that's one of the reasons I picked it was just to give myself an excuse to sit and watch it. Um, I'm definitely also I gotta show it to my wife. Uh, she's out of town right now, but I will. Uh, I, I was sitting there and I was watching it, and my wife will love it just for the, uh, the costuming and such. Yeah. Um, you know, although she will probably appreciate it for its uh, for its uh, plot and everything as well. Uh, I will say one a little detail that you might have missed is in the opening credits, there are um, <laughs> there is a a separate credit in the opening credits for hats by <laughs> so and so and lingerie by so and so. Oh, really. Um, the uh, the hats uh, thing I was particularly uh, struck by in the sequence where the uh, the doctor is uh, examining her and she is uh, yeah. topless. He is giving her an X ray and she's wearing this amazing hat. Um, so that <laughs> yeah. that shot is probably worth uh, worth watching the movie just for that that mm -hmm. sequence. So you know, don't forget. yeah. Um... All right, I, I'd say uh, check it out. Also, I just mentioned um, it is on Netflix. Uh, there's also a version on YouTube, and I have no idea if it's the same exact same version or if it's a different cut, but it is on YouTube as well in case you're uh, interested and you don't have Netflix. So there you go. Next week we'll review that version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we'll move on to our second film now, which is Computer Chess from 2013, and I'll, uh, again, let you uh, get into the introduction for this, Daniel. Sure. Um, this is one I kind of saw the trailer for back when it was uh, originally kind of released. Uh, it does fit into the uh, the mumblecore genre, mm -hmm. of which I haven't seen a lot of the films in the genre, um, uh, but it, it was kind of this indie genre. It's, well, it's still existing, but it, it's kind of um, lots of non-actors, naturalistic performances, um, a lot of people who actually kind of live in the um, in the uh, worlds that are portrayed in the film. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a uh, it's sort of similar to the Dogma 95 movement, um, if you remember that. Um, although it's not nearly as strict as the Dogma 95 movement. Should I explain that? Or do you, yeah, that'd be a good um, idea. Sure. Um, Dogma 95 was this thing. Um, Lars von Trier is probably the most con the most famous. Uh, uh, person in this movement, um, but the idea was uh, to uh, do films that don't do the Hollywood formula of, uh, mm -hmm. and, to, and to strip down everything to its purest essentials. So um, you film on locations, no sets. You can't bring a prop onto a set. If you need a particular like item, you have to go somewhere where that thing is found and um, and uh, you know, largely improv improvisational dialogue, um, things like you know, no guns in the film, like they didn't want any guns to be in the film, and it was supposed to be this like artistic thesis that like filmmakers would sign on, you know, as like oh, a, a yeah. manifesto of this is what we're going to do. Uh, Mumblecore isn't nearly anything like that. Mumblecore is a lot more kind of like what critics just started calling a bunch of films that were coming out starting in the early 2000s. And the director of this film, I learned, was the kind of the progenitor of these films. Mm -hmm. um, he made a couple, and uh, I'm, I'll probably go and sit down and watch more of his films just because I did find this interesting. Yeah. Um, 
So anyway, computer chess is actually shot on... I, I did a little reading on Wikipedia on this, so... Um, it's actually shot on vintage 1968 mm-hmm. Sony VHS camera or, or videotape cameras, not even VHS. Yeah. Um, it's kind of purportedly... I mean, when I first saw the trailer, I thought it was actually a documentary yeah. about a uh, computer chess tournament of... Uh, People uh, working for, you know, there's a Caltech team, there's a, like an NYU team, I think, or an MIT team, and there are mm-hmm. some different um, idiosyncratic people. Um, I, originally, I thought that this actually was a documentary, like yeah. filmed about that, about some real thing. Um, it looks pretty note perfect. I mean, I'm not an expert on like what you know, the computing standard was in 1981 or whatever, so there might, I'm sure I know some people who could. Um, you know, yeah. deconstruct this and go, well, actually, the uh, the PDP-11 was uh, not, you know, was not in that housing in 1981. I mean, that was more the 1983 model or, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm sure that, like, the details are not exactly right, but, I mean, this world looks note perfect. I mean, mm-hmm. it's very um, shot there. They're, you know, kind of chessboards, a lot of, um, you know, overhead projectors. I mean, the, the, the film has a lot of fun with the the accoutrement of, you know, what this world would have looked like in 1981. Mm-hmm. But it essentially follows a group of, uh, you know, there are like four or five different groups of people writing uh, computer software um, on these old teletypes, or these all, you know, before the personal computer era, so yeah. these, like, big bulky machines that would play chess against each other. And it's, and it's you know, whoever wins the tournament wins, you know, a $7,500 prize and, you know, some et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in this kind of rundown cheap motel, there are a couple other groups. There's a free love group yeah. that's um, you know connected connects us who films there. There's a free love group doing their thing, and then there's a uh, kind of uh, new agey post hippie group doing some um, some of their rituals. And it kind of is about the intersection of these three worlds in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, the film is largely plotless. There, there are some, there are a handful of kind of interesting characters and some interesting moments. Um, but if, but if you're going in, it, it has even less plot than the Libertine. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, uh, but I think it's a really interesting film, and I think it, it definitely kept my interest uh, throughout. Um, I, I have a little bit of a background in this. I'm not a uh, computer scientist, but I've read a lot of the um, kind of documentary. Material from from this era of computing. I've, uh, I you know, I minored in math. I was gonna study computers for a while, so you know, I, I kind I know this type of person, and I definitely recognize this world. Uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty spot on. Mm. Um, when I first watched this, uh, again, like I said, I went in cold into these two films. So when I was I start watching this, I was convinced for the first about fifteen minutes that this was a straight up documentary. Uh, from that era, um, I was, I did not recognize uh, Wiley Wiggins at all from <laughs> right. Days of Confused. So I mean, you know, he was unrecognizable. So I, I thought I bought that these were all real people. Um, the 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 chess grandmaster guy who is going to take on the winning computer is actually like a notable film critic. Yep. Um, yeah. No, I was yeah. reading about him as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like an academic film critic for NYU or something, yeah. Yeah, um, so I was watching this and I was like, okay, I'm convinced. This is uh, this is a documentary shot on early cameras that date back to, I think I think they were first made in like the 60s, those cameras. Yeah, like, it's, a, it's a 1968 model, like there's a particular Sony camera that the uh, mm-hmm. the film was shot on from 1968. I, I looked it up on Wikipedia. So. Yeah, so it, it's it's all in, uh, so the whole movie is is black and white, well, there's one part that's not black and white, but it's all it's all in 4 by 3 framing and everything mm-hmm. like that, so it looks very authentic. Um, and I was I was convinced. I was I was watching it, but then I started seeing some uh, camera angles and some transitions and stuff. That's like okay, there's no way that this is a documentary. It, it's shot in a modern style. If it was a yeah. document, I mean, and the thing is, like, the, despite like if you look at a, a frame of footage from it, it kind of it feels like a documentary. Mm-hmm. It's not. A, I mean, the, clearly, like they didn't have that level of access. Yeah. You know, to to the people. I mean, this is definitely a kind of dramatic piece. Um, but it, it's very easy to kind of, at a glance, confuse this for a documentary. Yeah, um, but um, but uh, I, I love the way they did it, that they tried to fully it's a documentary at first, because for me, it totally sucked me into that world. So even though it switched over to being a, a dramatic movie, I was sucked into it enough, and I was engaged with the characters enough that 
I didn't give a fuck anymore. I was just, mm-hmm. I was always watching it and I was enjoying it. Um, because uh, essentially after a while, you suddenly get a shot perspective from a different camera. Uh, mm-hmm. The original cameraman's fiddling with his fucking camera. And so you're like, okay, something's going on here. Um, but I, I was, I was really, I was just taken back by how interesting this film was. I mean, these characters, they talk like, real geeks like this is the this is sort of the uh germination of like geek culture like mm-hmm. to, to a certain degree like this the, is the 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 real world version of the people who are in revenge of the nerds yeah, the, yeah this is who the this is who these guys are you know the, this is you know these characters are you know hypothetically you know revenge of the nerds was made in 1984 this takes place in 80 81 somewhere in that in that range you know these could have been the upper classmen when, you know, Skolnick and Gilbert show up in, you know, at Adams College in Revenge yeah. of the Nerds. I mean, it's, it's very much like that, that same era. And this feels just, like, no perfect and real. Like, this mm-hmm. does not feel like some fake Hollywoodized version of this world. And it doesn't feel modern either. They don't feel like today's, like, like they're not sitting and having conversations about comic books and pop culture mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. These are mathematicians to computer scientists. Like, this is, yeah. you know right before the birth of the of the personal computer. And, you know, what I find interesting is that it, it sets you in this very kind of real world and this very kind of concrete, you know, run-down motel, teletypes and pocket protectors world. And then as the film gets more abstract as you as you kind of move on, uh, you know, you the, the visual style of the film doesn't change. You're still kind of stuck mm-hmm. in this, like, very, you know, kind of mundane reality, which I think grounds the film in a lot of ways. Yeah, um, uh, this this was before um, all the sur- sort of different geek cultures kind of converged to the point yeah. now where everyone wants to be a geek. You know, everyone, yeah. to ev- whether they're a geek or not, they want to pretend they're a geek. You know, like it, it's it's before it, it's much more uh, at this point. It's it's seeing a section of the overall culture now that at that time was very much more insular and very competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, like all the people here are very competitive. They're very standoffish for well, the most part. They're academics. Either yeah. these are college kids. These are you know kind of upper level. You know either either upper level undergraduates or, or kind of grad students studying. Uh, you know, working on this artificial intelligence problem, mm-hmm. um, and then you get a couple of like kind of wizened old professors kind of wandering around who are like the heroes to these guys. Yeah. Um, and it, I mean, it feels like a lot of the conversations that these guys have with each other. I mean, I've had these conversations. I mean, these are the kinds of guys who are programming in Fortran 77. Like, mm-hmm. we'll just we'll just leave it at that. Uh, I actually have programmed in Fortran 77 in high school, <laughs> um, so I'll just I'll leave it at that. But these this is that particular class. Of, you know. Um, I don't know. Uh, what did you? I, I don't want to get too much into detail on the on the uh, end of the film. We'll, we'll not spoil like the big reveals on this because I sure. I, I want people to see this film. But um, I think we definitely do have to like discuss some things if very loosely at the very least. You sure. know, what do you think of the kind of more um, abstract stuff? Like like as the the kind of the themes of artificial intelligence and such become more pronounced. What do you think of that like change in tone as the film moves on? Well, it's interesting because um, depending on how you want to interpret this film and its ending, um, this this film could be a very um, almost like, uh, I guess, metaphysical exploration of human nature and how it relates to artificial intelligence, or it could be a straight up horrific, uh, <laughs> horrific movie, horror movie, actually, mm-hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, that, that, that last shot. I mean, depending on how you interpret that last shot, I mean, it, it, it has a lot of implications for the rest of the film, sure. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, I, I I really love the conversations these people have because they sound real, because they're very uh, kind of stunted, and they they sort of go on and on and on. They go in circles. They sort of talk like real people actually do. That's I guess that's sort of the strength of having um, real actors with people who are not actors, but, you know, we're in the certain fields related to this and the fact that the script itself was only an eight page treatment. It wasn't a real script. So it was a lot of improv improvisational uh, sort of stuff. Um, I loved how, as you watch the movie go on, even before the one female uh, character as part, you know, one of the, not the one female character, but the one female character in the 
chess club teams. Yeah, yeah, the the the, the female kim programmer. Yeah, yeah, uh, brings up the point about how she was sort of seeing how everyone in this place was sort of like a chess character, mm-hmm. and you actually kind of pick that up as you're watching the film, but even beforehand, how people are going through sort of patterns that they can't quite break out of. Like the, my favorite character, uh, the Papa George character. who I knew he'd be your favorite. Yep. Yeah, who the, is the, the, the lovable loser, you know? Yeah. Who is this? Uh, uh, he's this independent programmer. I put programmer in italics because I don't know if he's ever programmed a thing in his life. He seems like a snake oil salesman who has just been stealing other people's stuff and using it for, for himself. But this guy is going in a loop. Like you watch him, he is constantly looking for like stuff (laughs) and he's constantly looking in the same places over and over again. And that's something that people really do. Like even when, when, whenever you like lose something in your life, like you, you're, you're missing your pair of pliers or something like that. You look in all the places that it's, definitely not at but you always look every time just try right. to find it um so this guy is just sort of wandering around the hotel uh <laughs> he's uh yeah. interesting note that his um uh, his room reservation gets lost yeah and so he's like oh i have to sleep on the you know he's he's trying to sleep on, on the floors of other people's you know rooms he's uh um, kind of invading people's spaces. He's mm-hmm. sleeping in the lobby of the hotel. Um, he eventually gets to sleep in the honeymoon sleep suite. Um, <laughs> and he's kind of one of the ways, like him searching for a place to sleep, is one of the ways that we kind of are narratively brought into the uh, the world of the New Age movement and mm-hmm. that sort of thing, which I, I think is really interesting that he's our, our kind of breakout character. Um, a couple of other characters that I thought were interesting that I, I'd like to mention are the um, the kind of documentary crew themselves, the, the people actually kind of making the film within the film, um, who are not, like, computer programmers, they're just kind of yeah. making this film, uh, or kind of shooting this footage, um, it's in their room that we kind of get the, uh, the like, the, the, the stoner party happens, and, you know, you kind of get um, a lot of the, at least early in the film, a lot of the kind of philosophical back and forth kind of happens there. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some really interesting kind of... Uh, I should probably see this again just to to see if I can kind of tease out some meaning in some of the stuff that they're talking about. But, I mean, uh, there's nothing in this film. I mean, so many of these kinds of films, you know, will kind of just throw up, like, some bullshit, you know, technical jargon. Yeah. Um, you know, at least as far as I can tell, and I'm not a, a software engineer and I don't uh, work in artificial intelligence, there's nothing here that feels, like, out of place. Like, this all, no. like, it, it feels pretty... Pretty rock solid, um, and yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, in that party they have the uh, two outsiders who are essentially um, like one of them is a drug dealer. Well, actually, mm-hmm. I think they're both drug dealers, really. Yeah, I kind of, um, I kind of get that feeling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're also uh, conspiracy theorists. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so they're they're picking these guys. They're supplying them with drugs and picking their brains and trying to see which one of these guys is like the. The, the guy they're going to contact, like, uh, for for the Matthew Broderick War Games movie, you know, <laughs> right, <laughs> eventually, right. Uh, because they're they're very concerned about uh, uh, what happens when a computer finally does beat, beat a person, and, uh, you know, um, well, what happens then? What happens when the computer is better than a person and thinks better than a person, you know? Uh, so they're going through all those sort of discussions, and um, I really like the, uh, the, the British uh, programmer, who, mm-hmm. who you know the, the guy who says uh, who has that little speech about how uh, like three scotches is just the right amount or whatever. Right. Like, <laughs> he, he any more than that he's drunk. Any less than that he can't focus. But with just three he can he can loosen up and he can still you can tackle yeah. problems. You can you way. can you can program anything with three scotches. A man with yeah. three scotches can program anything. Yeah, no, that, that's that's interesting. Um, I kind of um, I kind of you know. Again, depending on how you want to interpret stuff, you know, you could kind of see the documentary crew. Like, I kind of started to read them as like maybe they're like um, from the defense department. You know, maybe these are they're they're like plants to like mm-hmm. watch these guys you know, under the auspices of being a documentary crew and like giving them drugs to like you know get them to loosen up and that sort of thing. Um, there's a really fascinating sequence which I don't know if you noticed um, in the uh, in that hotel room during that sequence. 
where um, two of the two of the guys, you know, are kind of sitting there. And they have like this little magnetic chessboard, this uh, like kind mm-hmm. of travel chessboard. And he said, "Do you play Knight's game or, or the night the night game or something like that?" Um, and he, you know, the camera focuses in, and there's a lot of conversation going on. And you kind of get some back and forth, but he literally just starts moving the piece around in like in this kind of sim- systematic pattern. But like, there's no like it's not connected to anything else that's going on. Mm-hmm. And you kind of get this like cult-like or, um, you know, repetitive pattern, this this superstition almost, uh, you know, like, like, a, like a little programming error or something. Um, it's, uh, there are lots of different ways you could read this film. Let's just, I'll just, I'll just kind of leave it yeah. at that. But um, really fascinating. Um, yeah, um, I thought it was funny also that if you, if you notice the uh, drug guys, their room in the hotel is 420. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> I yeah. did not notice that, yeah. And the, the room uh, Papa George finally ends up in is uh, 217, which, you know, becomes 13 at, the, at uh, if you put all the numbers together. Um, <laughs> and apparently that's a math joke. I don't know what the math joke is, but uh, they, they do make a reference to that in the film. Uh, yeah, I, I looked it up to see what, what 217 meant, you know. Mm. Although I didn't realize he actually was in that room. I really need to watch this film again because that's the number that the computer predicts where he would end up. Yeah. Um, I looked up 217, and there's uh, a little bit of a, uh, you know, like, like there's some uh, mathematical kind of jiggery-pokery you can do with, like, 217. If you take it apart, it does um, this kind of funky thing. But it doesn't seem to be, like, uniquely weird or anything like that. Um, yeah. But uh, that's just, again, just from kind of googling it and checking out the wikipedia page but yeah. um you know and there's there's some interesting stuff here i saw um uh all the cats that are running loose in the in the in the hotel um mm-hmm. i i kind of thought that must have been like a slightly because this movie is sort of about um where we end up with like the internet and and how everyone's connected now in the world by computers mm-hmm. and everything I kind of thought that was maybe some sort of like sly little in joke about cat memes and how yeah, yeah, about they are. cats all over the internet. Yeah. You know, that's I mean that's entirely possible. I I kind of viewed it as is this kind of like fluffy, you know, this world of computer chess, particularly in that era, is so um, hard and mechanical and mathematical, and there's this brute force approach. I mean, mm-hmm. um, what's interesting is that today um, we we. You know the, the chess problem, like like uh, Gary Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue in like 1996 or 97, you know, somewhere around that mm-hmm. era, and um, that software actually used a a brute force approach. I mean, it's essentially just I can calculate more moves further ahead than a, than a human grandmaster, and a human grandmaster can't calculate it. That a human grandmaster just intuits where the pieces are going to be and, and like does a lot of calculation, but ultimately, you know. Just it excludes certain decision trees based on mm. just playing so many games, whereas the computer software will literally just um, calculate every possible move. And so the whole thing was like, eventually, what happens is we just have enough processing power that we can just beat any human. You know, yeah. um, what's interesting is that like since then, like modern day artificial intelligence research is a lot more about learning systems, um, whereby you can kind of train computers to do just about anything by giving them some general, like, set of tasks, get them to try it, then when they do it very badly, you show them the better, you know, the the correct answer, and then you just iterate that over and over and over again until eventually the computer can solve problems that we can't just based on, like, it just gets kind of, kind of gets better and better and will make decisions that are not, like, that that are not the, the kind that human beings would make um, or will leave things into systems and go, well, there's this piece that doesn't seem like it does anything, but then you take that piece out and then the whole thing stops working. And you go, well, how, how does that work exactly, you know? Um, so it's interesting that, um, you know, in, in 80 or 81, you know, it, like in that time period, you know, everything really was brute force. Mm-hmm. And yet they, they're kind of having conversations about doing kind of more high-level stuff and that sort of thing. But... Um, it's interesting that, that it exists in that time period, and yet it's still kind of having these conversations about more intuitive uh, kinds of approaches to uh, to different kinds of problems and that sort of thing. Um, and again, I'm not an artificial intelligence researcher, so um, a lot of what I just said could be completely wrong, but um, <laughs> hopefully we have someone more knowledgeable who can correct me. 
Yeah. Um, I like the little uh, brief color segment where Papa George takes the drug dealer to his mom's house to mm-hmm. uh, look for money. Um, yep. it, it, it seemed like they were making an explicit point there that uh, um, everyone in the hotel was... Um, I mean, if you if you go over this uh, overarching idea that um, they're making a comparison to the actual people in the, in the hotel to pieces on a chessboard and how human patterns are not necessarily all that different from artificial intelligence... Um, they kind of escape that trap of the of the hotel, which is all in black and white. So it's just mm-hmm. like a chessboard, black and white squares, and they go into the real world, which is in color, and they escape that. So I, I don't know if that was the point or not. I just it was something I sort of took took from that, just in the back of my head. But um, yeah, I I kind of saw it as like going and meeting, like because there is no um, I mean you could view it. I mean that that's certainly a valid way. You could also view it as uh. Within the hotel, there are no, like, familial relationships between anybody there. Mm-hmm. There's no, like, we're all just connected by this shared mutual interest that we have. Uh, whereas once you end up with the uh, Papa George's character's mother, you have a, a, a you know, quote-unquote authentic, which I, I hate to kind of use, I mean, that's a little bit loaded, but yeah. um, this more authentic, uh, organic relationship, literally like this is my mom sort of thing. Um, and being more connected into this larger biological reality um, might might kind of be part of what we're seeing there in terms of the decision to, to go to color for that scene and that scene only. Um, it's also the sequence in which the uh, connection between human beings uh, running essentially bits of code is made most explicit. Mm-hmm. Um, you actually get a little uh, <laughs> a little um, uh, caption at the bottom, which is uh, you know something like you know closed loop or something like that. <laughs> um, so, so I mean, saying that the Papa George is caught in this loop. I mean, it, it's it's where the film gets most explicitly about the human beings as kind of running pieces of code yeah. uh, idea. Um, there's a lot. I mean, it's this is what's funny is that this film, the issue that you can that I kind of run into with these kind of things is that um, there's a lot of really interesting conversation we can have about this film. I don't know how much of this is in the film. You know, I mm-hmm. don't know. How much of it is just okay? It's kind of deliberately vague and, and open-ended to kind of generate these kinds of discussions. But I'm not sure how much of this is like intended by the filmmakers, and how much of it is just kind of what we bring to it. Yeah. Um. Sort of the same issue I had with Beyond the Black Rainbow, which we uh, discussed a little while ago. Um. I think this is. I mean, honestly, I actually prefer this film to Beyond the Black Rainbow. You mm-hmm. may, me too. May not agree. Um. I think it's a good film. I think it's worth seeing. Um, I think, but and I think it engenders conversation. But um, I I might be interested in actually seeing if there's like a, a DVD commentary track or a documentary or something about it because I think that um, kind of getting at some of the core of like what the filmmakers intended might help to clarify some of this. But um, absolutely a fascinating film, and, and again it's on Netflix, so you should you should watch it. Yeah. Um, and it is only like 92 minutes long or something. Yeah, so um, these are both really short. I I loved it. I, I am going to buy it. I'm going to find a copy and buy it. Um. For me personally, uh, I won't go into details. Of course, we don't want to, like I said, we don't want to give away too much about the film because there's it is very open ended on what it's talking should, about. Should we do like a spoiler section at the very end of the show, maybe? Uh, well, okay. L- what should I say? I'll, I'll just say anyone listening right now, uh, just mute your podcast for the next five minutes or so. <laughs> just skip ahead five minutes. Well, yeah. we're, we're going to do a very brief kind of discussion of the ending. Yeah, because. Um, it's not I, something that you can really spoil, but it's probably something you should you should go in without. I mean, you should go in with as few preconceived notions. As well, possible. yeah, you can you can still interpret the ending different, but the way I interpreted the ending, and we're going into it now, so you know, turn away now or forever hold your peace. Um, <gasps> when the quote unquote main character, because essentially he becomes the focus of the movie after yeah, in the, the, in the last half. third or so, yeah, yeah, half, uh, yeah. Peter. Um, when he brings the prostitute into his room after kind of realizing that he blew it with the female programmer, um, and she takes that piece off her head and sees the circuit board in there, I think that pretty much confirms my fears that, uh, this is almost the prequel to the Terminator films. That uh, (laughs) the artificial intelligence, this was the germination stage of that, and... 
that the prostitute is an example of where we eventually end up. And the prostitute may be just there to <laughs> maybe protect against John Connor or yeah. something, you know, <laughs> I don't, well, I don't, I don't know. You, you know. could, you could, you could view this. I mean, the way I would, I would almost suggest to view this. Um, and I, based on a couple other little things is, uh, this is not taking place in 80 or 81. This is taking place sometime in the future where you've got human beings who believe it's 1981 being programmed by some larger software thing, you know, so, so essentially, that's... like, everybody's living in the Matrix or some version of that, well, that's interesting and, like, too, by yeah. running experiments on these human beings, the, the software is, like, teaching itself how human beings react. Uh, I mean, there, there are lots of different ways you can interpret it. I think what's interesting is that the... I mean, again, just... To, to say this, there's no way because the, the, the genesis of a lot of this questioning that this lead character has is because the software program doesn't want to play other computers, but it'll play yeah. human beings. And, you know, kind of later in the film, we learned that this thing has, like, natural language capabilities and can actually speak and ask questions and believes it has a soul and all that sort of thing, um, which is fascinating in and of itself. But there's no way that software can run on the hardware that... Mm-hmm. Is existing, you know, so I kind of, I mean, if you view this, if you view this through that lens, is like this is kind of a larger simulation, you know, a simulation of this world that is that is being put together by some other intelligence, hypothetically an artificial intelligence from the mm-hmm. future or something. Um, what you're seeing there is that the computer that doesn't want to play is sort of the uh, the probe. It's the testing element. It's the like, how are these human beings designing software are going to react when one of their computers doesn't react the way they want it to and when it starts to show intelligence. So well, that's just, just a way that I would I could kind of see. Well, that even... Uh, I like that one as well because that definitely um, fits in with the theme of uh, everyone being a chess piece on the board and mm-hmm. how that sort of, fit, sort of feels that way. Um, but yeah, I, I just felt... Um, I felt like, like wow... Uh, I saw that final shot and I was like, holy shit. Uh, I just had thoughts of Terminator in my head. <laughs> I, um, and also, um, am I wrong or did the, did the chess computer want to commit suicide? Because I, I got the feeling that Peter was assisting it in committing suicide. I could, you could definitely make that argument. I, I wouldn't argue with that. I, I, I'd want to see the film again before I'd make mm-hmm. a, uh, make a concrete judgment on that, but uh, you could definitely make that argument, yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a, I, I will say, I, I mean, we're wrapping up here, and I, I think I'm done with spoilers right now, yeah, just if, yeah. if that's okay with you. Spoilers um, done! Yeah, um, so, um, I will say there's a, there's a really rich literature out there in science fiction and in science fact about uh, artificial intelligence and what artificial intelligence might mean mm-hmm. uh, for for the human beings involved, and uh, I can put together a list for next week's show if you're at all interested. Um, hey, there are sure. some really good, um, really good books, and um, particularly books. I mean, the, most of the movies that are kind of about artificial intelligence tend to kind of be fairly simplistic in their treatment. Mm-hmm. I think this film, I mean, if it is, if there really is like a level of meaning that is being um, put together here that's like kind of like what we were talking about in the spoiler section, then uh, I this film is probably more sophisticated than most films in terms of talking about these issues. Um, but there are, there are a lot of really great... Um, there's a lot of really great writing going back on this stuff, like back to the 50s, um, mm-hmm. when people first started kind of thinking about, like, what does it mean if there is a computer that can think? Um, and I can... I'll, I'll try to put together some, uh, some books... For uh, for our listeners to possibly look into if they're interested. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, all right, so I guess we, I guess we can wrap up. Um, I'll say definitely again, see Computer Chess. Definitely, if, if you're going to see any of the either of these two films, definitely see Computer Chess. Um, for me, it's one of my favorite films I've seen this year so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love it. Uh, so high highest recommendation, honestly. Yeah, no, uh, Computer Chess is. I mean, The Libertine. I liked. Uh, I would recommend it for the people that that think it sounds interesting. It, it's a nice little film in that genre. Yeah. Computer Chess is something really different and really original. And um, you know, uh, I I don't know. I'd have to see. I mean, later in the year, I've started putting together a best of list already. You know, yeah. kind of thinking like what would go on my list. This could very easily end up on my like kind of ten best of the year kind of list. So 
uh, I would highly recommend it, um, especially if you're at all interested in kind of artificial intelligence and and the, the conversations surrounding it. All right, awesome. Uh, so thanks, Dan, for uh, these two awesome choices. It was it was definitely enjoyable to uh, watch these and talk about them, uh, especially yeah. computer chess. <laughs> yeah, no, um, computer chess is great. Yeah. I honestly um, thought, like, computer chess would be kind of heady and, and quiet, and I'm like, oh, and then we'll throw some boobs in. Like, that'll be fun, too, you know? <laughs> Good balance, yeah. Good um, balance. Yeah, so uh, plug your Doctor Who podcast, sir. Sure. If you, like, listen to me talk about uh, things like artificial intelligence and uh, science fiction and that sort of thing, uh, you should check out uh, my podcast. I actually forgot to give the website last time, so, uh, you know, uh, oispaceman.libsyn.com. That's oispaceman, all word, dot com, And uh, it's a Doctor Who podcast I do with my wife, uh, Shana. And uh, we talk a lot about pretty much everything classic and new series um, from a kind of uh, lefty, liber- liberal kind of uh, philosophical perspective and uh, lots of dirty jokes. So mm-hmm. you know, um, enjoy it. We uh, just uh, discussed the Rebos operation, which yep. is my personal all-time favorite classic Doctor Who story. And I'm really proud of the episode we put out. So, uh, you know, if you're listening to this live, go and check it out. It's It'll be the first one that you see. Yeah, and it was really good. So um, definitely check it out. Uh, and you'll get our uh, little trailer at the end of this for uh, all of our particulars at our pod, Podbean site. And you can check all of our links out and links to other great podcasts. You can leave comments and questions either under the YouTube version or you can email direct me directly. That is on the Podbean thing and you know we definitely want comments and questions we want ideas for if you if you watch computer chess we'd love to hear your theories yes. about what's going on in computer chess um so i mean i would I, I didn't talk about this with you beforehand but i would love to do another like spoiler section just on computer chess and like talk about other people's ideas about what's going on in the in the movie so uh, please please put that out there I'd, I'd love to get other people's thoughts on about what this film is really trying to do yeah definitely um and if you got uh, ideas for movies you want to see us uh, do, uh, coming in August, we're going to be doing our uh, slasher film series. Uh, hopefully, Paul and I are going to finalize the list tonight if I can get a hold of them. Um, and we're, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And uh, after that, you know, anything's pretty much game for a while. And uh, also, if you have, you know, uh, Ideas for Movie God, if you've been following the podcast and you've seen us do our Movie God game, if you want to throw some things at me or Daniel, that's also quite welcome. Uh, I mean, if you want to send something for for me, you can send it to Daniel's Twitter or his, you know, his... My uh, Twitter, that's probably the best way. Yeah, yeah, his Twitter or whatever, and then he can just hide it from me and uh, <laughs> and uh, and throw it at me on, on an episode, and you can do vice versa as well. Send it to my Twitter. Um, and yeah, Thank you guys very much for uh, listening again. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for joining me. And uh, any ideas of what you want to go out on for music? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this one's kind of a hard one to do for the for these two films, but uh... yeah, yeah, uh, some '80s piece of synth pop brilliance. That's got to be what you go out on, like uh, you know, something from Devo or something. That that would be my my uh, my choice. All right, that's awesome. We'll we'll try to make that happen. All right, guys, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. For our other episodes, links to Daniel, Paul, and Lee's other stuff, and links to some great podcasts of similar interest, visit us at tmbdos.podbean.com. There you can leave us comments on the site or directly email us. We listen and respond to everything. Thank you. Drive through.